encouragement. Say, not today, devil. Say, not today, devil. Say, not today, devil. Today, I am going to teach on overcoming sin and temptation. Uh, I believe that this can be a hindrance sometimes to us as believers in the body of Christ. Now, why is it that we are not living the best of life when God has already promised the best of life? You know that he's already promised that we will be victorious. He said that we will always triumph through Christ and that the enemy is defeated in Colossians chapter 2. Then why is it that we are not feeling the victory and each and every day. And maybe you may say, hey, well, I'm victorious. Well, I believe that you're doing some things that I'm going to talk about here today if you say that I'm victorious in each and every way. But I want to talk to you today about overcoming sin and temptation. Now, I can't uh, get deep into details because of time. But what I want to do is I want to give you just a brief overview. So when we go back to the Garden of Eden, uh, we go to Genesis chapter 3. We see that um, Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden. Anybody remember hearing about the story of creation and Adam and Eve? You might have heard it, you know, in Children's Church. And, uh, and hey, shout out to uh, our young people who came to Freedom Conference. Woo I know you all. And that dance was pretty dope, so amen. Um, but Adam and Eve, they were placed in the garden. And what happened was in chapter 3 at the beginning, we see Satan come and he slithered in. He was a snake, slithered on in. And then he started talking to Eve. And it was a problem because of what he was saying. And he came and said, now did God really say that you shouldn't eat of every tree of the fruit, uh, uh, the fruit of every tree in the garden? And then Eve said, no, we can eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but there's one tree that we can't eat because God said we'll die. And then Satan said, come on, you won't die. It's all good. Come on, you know, I, I, I don't believe that. You know, and, and so he convinced her and then he said, you know, God might have said that because he knows that when you eat it, you're going to be able to know good and evil. You're going to be wise just like him. So we see in verse 6 where Eve got caught up. Say caught up. Oh. Eve got caught up in verse 6 because she started looking at the tree. And then it says, so when the woman saw that it was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. Oh, that's where she got caught. She looked at it long enough to start desiring what she was told not to have. And then she ate it and then gave to her husband. And they ate it together. And then the next verse talks about what happened because now they sinned. Because in the garden, the only way to sin was to go against what God had said to do. So now they sinned and then the eyes of them were both open and they were naked and they sewed Louis Vuitton fig leaves together. Well, why did they sew fig leaves together? Because now they were something called ashamed. They were ashamed. And how many of us, when we do the wrong thing, you know, uh, it, it takes some training to just repent instead of covering it up. Come on, I used to be a teenager. So I would sin, and then I would try to cover it up. I try to make it good. We don't want to call it cover up. We try to fix it. Come on, fix it. So that's what they tried to do. They tried to fix it. But then God came down and started walking in the cool of the day looking for Adam. And Adam went and hid. Duh, that's stupid. Why would you try to hide from God? He's everywhere. He knows everything. But yet it's crazy the same way we try to cover up when we did something wrong, right? Like God doesn't know. Come on now. And so they went and hid from the presence of God. And they said because they were naked or because they were ashamed. And then it says in verse 10 that they heard his voice and hid. And that's where the issue comes. Because it's not just a sin issue, but it's what sin does. Can I have my first uh, PowerPoint slide? Because there's a cycle that happens here. And I want to show you exactly what this cycle looks like. And then we're actually going to cover five points about how you can defeat flesh, sin, 
and temptation. And so you see right up here on the screen, you see at the very top it says unmet needs and wrong desires. A lot of times what the enemy will try to start with will stem from two things, unmet needs or wrong desires. What is an unmet need? That I feel like I'm missing something that needs to be there. I feel like I need love, so in order to get love fulfilled, I go look for this guy over here. And in order to keep that love fulfilled, I give him a piece of my body over here. Or unmet needs in other different ways. So you have unmet needs, and then you also have wrong desires. And I showed you in the scripture, then Eve was looking, and she started desiring that thing that God said, don't touch. God, or God said, don't eat. And so those unmet needs, wrong desires, then they go to temptation. So those two things strengthen temptation. But when temptation is acted upon, then that leads to sin. And now after sin comes shame, guilt, and condemnation. Shame and guilt. It's feeling bad about what you did. But here's the problem. When you keep sinning, you stop feeling bad about what you did and you start feeling bad about who you are. And when you start feeling bad about who you are, notice it doesn't make you want to run to God. It makes you want to go hide from God. So when I see a young person, I say, what's up? I haven't seen you in like, like five months. How you been? And they say, oh, I'm good, Pastor Dave. You know, I just, I just been going through a lot. So going through a lot is church terminology for I've been sinning. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I've just been going through a lot past that. Oh, really? Tell me about your sin stories. <laughs> Let's go to the cross together. We can get you forgiveness for that. And so what happens is shame, guilt, and condemnation will always work to drive you away from the presence of God. Now, God promised. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So God didn't leave. If you feel distant from God, it's because you left. Because God ain't leave. He can't, and he can't go against his word. And so shame, guilt, and condemnation are working today in 2017, just like they were back in the garden. They're working to separate our young generation and our young at heart generation from God, from the promises of God, from the power of God, and from the operation of the Holy Spirit. It is hard to do signs, wonders, and miracles when you feel bad about who you are. It is very, very difficult. If you think about how you slipped up last night and then you over here trying to like pray for healing for somebody over here. Or you over here trying to prophesy or lay hands or get somebody saved or, and, and what happens is the enemy will replay that scenario. He'll replay how you missed it over and over in your head. You'll be in the middle of praying for somebody. He'll be like, you remember how you cussed that girl out on the phone last night? Do you remember what she said? I can tell you what she said. The enemy will try to replay that thing over and over and over. But what we want to do is we want to keep God first place. We're marked for God, right? We're marked for God, right? Okay, let's quickly go through this. Submit and resist. My uh, second slide, please. Submit and resist. We're going to overcome temptation. The first step, you want to submit and resist. It says in James chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7. I'll read verse 7 first. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, when you see the word therefore, you got to find out what it's there for. Yes, that wasn't a trick question. Verse 6, it says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to to the humble. Now, we find, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But it starts with humility. It's hard to resist the devil when you won't submit to God. And it's hard to submit to God when you know everything. Hello. 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 Come on, because when you know everything, then you've already solved your own problem in theory, right? 
So how can God teach somebody who already knows it? How can God help somebody when they're busy helping themselves? Come on. And so it says, Sub, be, uh, humble yourself. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He gives strength and empowerment to the humble. And then it says, as you submit to God, you will resist the devil and he will flee from you. It is a trained response by the enemy that when you have submitted to God's way of doing things, all he knows how to do is run. But you got to resist them the right way. Now that word submit to God, it actually means to obey God. God and his word are one. So you can't claim to obey God if you're not obeying his word. Right? Some people try to, they try to say, I'm, obey, I'm obeying God. I'm like, how, bro? Did you read Romans? How? How are you obeying? I mean, I can help you, but let's, let's be real with each other. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. So this is what I want to do. Um, you right here. Yeah, can I borrow you just for a second? Come on up here. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you an example of resistance, okay? All right. You ready? One, two, three, resist. Let's try it again. Watch this there. One, two, three, resist. Now, that's resistance. Let me show you what resistance is not. One, two, three, resist. One, two, three, resist. Still there? No, that's not resistance. Resistance is not passive. So whenever we claim to be resisting the enemy, that doesn't mean ignoring him. That means that we are doing something that is changing his position and enforcing our position. That's resistance. My wife doesn't like to be tickled on her knee. She doesn't like it. But when I go and try it, see, she resists me. She slapped my hand away. That's resistance. We can't ignore the devil away. And if you think if you just ignore him, he'll get tired and run away, I have news for you. The enemy's been at this for many, many centuries. And he got mad endurance, son. Mad endurance. He would keep going and going and going and going. But we got to resist him. How do we resist him? Say with the word. the word. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you. We resist him with the word. Number two, use what you have. Use your weapon. Use what you have. Use your weapon weapon what is the weapon the word of god it says in second corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds it says in hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 that the word of god is sharp it's quick it's powerful sharper than any two-edged sword so the word of god is defined as a weapon but how can i defeat the enemy if i don't use my weapon my opinion doesn't defeat him. My good looks don't defeat him. My nice jeans don't defeat him. My many followers don't defeat him. My bank account, my degree, who I know, where I'm from, what I got does not defeat the enemy. The only thing that the enemy submits to is the power of the word of God. And if you show that you got that, he gone. He gone. Oh, I'm preaching now. Ooh-wee. Matthew chapter 4. I can say a whole lot, but I got to keep going. Matthew chapter 4. I mean, I know you look good, but the enemy ain't scared of that. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Jesus showed us the blueprint. Say blueprint. blueprint. Jesus showed us the blueprint for exactly how to defeat the enemy. It says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Hold up. Jesus was led to be tempted. Are you telling me that God allowed him to be tempted? Yup. As a matter of fact, the spirit led him to a place that temptation was. Wow. However, Jesus knew what to do. Now let me ask you a question. If you're in eighth grade, 
were you able to graduate to eighth grade without completing all the tests and coursework for seventh grade? Is anybody in here able to graduate high school without doing nothing, jack squat, no tests, no, no homework, no nothing? Anybody? I'm trying to be on with you all. I'm trying to get some of my students on that plan. Okay, no. So that means that in order to get to the next level, you always have to pass the test. So in order to show yourself approved, you got to pass the test. Hey, your walk in life is going to be the same way. God wants to promote you and elevate you, but he's not going to make you exempt from the test. He's going to let you go through the test to show you what's in your heart and be able to lean on him, have faith on him, and trust in him and everything that he's taught you in the season to be able to go to the next level. So notice, Jesus wasn't alone. He was equipped because the chapter before says that he was anointed. That he had been baptized and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove and he had been anointed. So now he was ready. He was fasted and prayed up. He fasted 40 days, 40 nights. And now verse 33, now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was not just some slick, fancy, New King James opinion. That was a scripture found in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. It was very calcula uh, calculated, carefully crafted response to what the devil said. It wasn't just an opinion. But notice the devil hit him at the place that probably was the most sensitive first. He had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and he came through with the Chick-fil-A. He came through with the fried chicken. Come on now. He came, came through with your favorite food and said, here you go. Turn, turn, turn this into that. Because I know you're hungry, Jesus. You've been fasting. Well done. But what did Jesus say? He rebuked him with the word of God. Then verse 5, the devil took, up, uh, took him up on a holy city. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now this is found in Psalms chapter 91. He's quoting scripture. <gasps> the devil is quoting scripture to Jesus? What is happening? And what did Jesus say to that? Did he, like, agree? Like, say, you know, devil, you got a point there. <laughs> we did say that, didn't we? Huh. Jesus said, verse 7, It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He had to have discernment to discern what's going on here. Come on, discernment. He had to have some discernment. But check this out. The enemy knew scripture, but if Jesus didn't have discernment to discern what was happening and how he was trying to twist the scripture, he would have fell for it instead of refusing it and resisting it. But you know what a real problem is and something that really concerns me about the young generation, and I believe that you all are changing that, it concerns me the amount of biblical illiteracy that our young generation has. Because how are you going to be ignited for Christ if you don't know what the heck he says? How are you going to resist the enemy with the word and you don't know what the word says? How are you going to get the promises of God when you don't know what God has promised? Then the enemy comes and says something and you say, huh, is that so? Well, maybe I should change my whole doctrine. That's what's happening in our society. But when you know the word, you know that all word is inspired by God and all word will confirm itself. The word will always validate itself, so one scripture can always be confirmed by several more. It will always prove itself out. But the enemy, he tried to get him with the okie doke. But Jesus said, no, not today, devil. And he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16 to him. And then the enemy took him on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, meaning fame and riches, and he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, this is the kicker. He said, Jesus, I'll give it all to you now. And Jesus, the reason why this was tempt tempting to him is because he came there to die on the cross, right? 
He came there to get back mankind, to defeat the enemy. Now, in first thought, this could feel like, wait a minute, this is a win for me. That's a win. All the kingdoms of the world and their glory, okay, win, ching, ching, mission done. Your boy don't have to go to the cross. Cool. But once again, he had to discern what was happening because he would have submitted his authority to the enemy by worshiping him. So what did he respond with? He responded with the scripture once again found in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 13. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then, verse 11, then the devil, what does it say? Wait, say it again? <laughs> say it again? Then the devil left him because, you know, the devil doesn't get tired because he looks so good. The devil gets tired when you beat him upside the face with the scripture. That's when he starts running. He's like, you know what, Pastor Dave, I had enough of this. Clearly, you know the word. and Clearly, I'm getting my butt whooped. So use the word. You got to use the word. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 and 13 says, taking up the whole armor of God. Well, if you have to take it up, that means that you don't have it already. Anything you have to take doesn't mean you already have. So just because you're saved doesn't mean you have taken up the whole armor of God. You have to take some time to take up the whole armor of God. And one of those things is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Just because you receive salvation doesn't mean you've decided to take up the sword of the spirit and the word of God. Because it says you have to take it. Then you have to use it. Let's go to the next, uh, next slide. Ask for God's help. Say, help me. No. Say, help me. No. Say, not today, devil. Not today, devil. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Uh, I'm going to read it out of the New Living Version, if we can, please. 1 Corinthians. Uh, I said 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 13, out of the New Living Translation. It says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. But when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Oh, that's a promise. Ding, ding, ding. Several things. God is faithful. He will not allow us to be tempted more than we can bear. And he promised to show us a way out. So let me show you how this works. In James chapter 1, verse 5, another promise. Any man who lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And it says God will give out freely and won't hold back. Real situation and scenario. Me and my wife were dating. We liked each other. We loved each other. I thought she was fine. And you know, I'm a man, she a woman. And that's, you know, and, and, and emotions rise. Can I be real? Is this okay? Okay. Maybe some of y'all ain't never got with nobody or dated nobody, so you keep, you keep on your thing. I'm going to tell you about my experience. Don't judge me. But we wanted to be pure. We wanted to stay pure. So when you're feeling somebody, the, 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 the tempter comes to say, oh, why don't you get a little closer? And get a little closer. And get a little closer. Now, why don't you touch? No, wait, wait, wait devil, hold on. Not today, devil. And so we asked the Holy Spirit, we asked God for a strategy. And you know what the Holy Spirit showed us? He showed us that uh, uh, when we were together, you know, we were adults, we both had our own places. He showed us that it seemed like there were certain times that when we were together and the time exceeded this certain time, that the temptation would get heavier. And so he told us to set a curfew for ourselves. Now, we were both grown. Living in our own place. But that's where the wisdom of God kicks in. And then you have to have discipline in order to implement the wisdom of God. Some of you all have been sitting on the wisdom of God because you won't be disciplined enough to implement it. You know what to do. Do it. You know what God has said. Do it. And then you come back Sunday after Sunday saying, Pastor Watson, pray for me. I'm still waiting for this thing to break free. You're not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. Hello. Okay, so God showed us the strategy. And so it was hard sometimes. Sometimes we didn't want to go away. Sometimes, you know, we wanted to want to stick with my babe, but I knew what the deal was. 
If we wanted this goal of purity, then we had to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And he helped us keep ourselves. And so what I'm telling you is the Holy Spirit will help keep you. But you have to ask for God's help. The Bible does not tell us to pray to God so that God would resist the devil. Let me say that again. The Bible doesn't tell us to pray to God so that God would resist the devil. It tells us to submit to God and obey him, and then we resist the devil through the word, through instruction, and he will flee. God's like, yo, Alexis, I done my part. I sent my son down to die. His blood was shed. You remember that? You remember Passion of the Christ? You remember that? I did my part. So I've given you all the victory you already need to have. All you have to do is side with the winning team. All you have to do is side on the side of victory. Let's keep going. Keep feeling the Holy Spirit, but I, I don't want to go in too deep. So I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm going I'm to tread right here. Amen. Number four, be honest with yourself. Ooh, be honest with yourself. Say, be real. Be real. Say, keep it real. Be Say, real. I keeps it real. <laughs> you got to be honest with yourself. I'm going to tell you this. I want you to write it down if you're taking notes. God can't help you fix a problem that you don't admit exists. Hello? Y'all hearing me? Let me say it over here. God can't help you fix a problem that you don't admit exists. The Holy Spirit is there to guide us, to lead us, to teach us. He is the comforter. He is the advocate. He'll show us some things about ourselves, but, you know, sometimes we could be slow to get the message. Sometimes. Maybe that's just me. And sometimes I could be a little slow to get the message. But that's what the enemy does. He's a deceiver. He comes to blind the mind. So we have to be honest with ourselves. So sometimes I get these scenarios where young people are coming to me and they're asking for prayer. And I start asking some questions because I don't just blindly pray for people, especially young people. I ask a few questions first because a lot of times prayer is the thing that will help. But then there's some to do's to walk out. There are some actual changes that have to be made. We can't like have God make lifestyle changes for us. We actually have to make lifestyle changes for ourselves. Hello. And so, so what happens is, you know, when they come for prayer, I say, what are we praying for? And they say, you know, da, 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 da. this is what we're praying for. I say, okay, great. I'm going to pray for you, but I have a couple questions to ask. And I ask them some questions. And they say, you know, I'm having uh, trouble with purity. or I'm having trouble lying or this or that. Or, you know, I, I want to do better here. I just, I can't walk in love. I'm snapping on my mom, snapping on my dad, my brothers, blah, 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 blah. And so I ask some questions, try to get some understanding. And a lot of times God will lead me right back to his word and tell them to meditate on the word of God. But here's the challenge. When they don't want to admit that they have an issue in this area, God cannot help you fix a problem that you don't admit exists. And when we blame others, we are automatically saying that we are not in control or we are not uh, um, in the driver's seat or we don't have anything to do with the fixing of this situation. If you find yourself saying them, 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 the problem is you. There's a common factor in every single situation and scenario. Hey, there's, there's no reason why you got issues with your mama, your teacher, your brother, your cousin, the girl down the street, um, you know, Shaniqua that lived down the corner. And then, you know, you got problems with the guy that you was trying to talk to. And then you walk in the store, you got problems with the little toddler that's right there that's trying to grab the same candy bar you're trying to grab. That is a problem. And if you find that you have problems with everybody, then, you know, when they say that when you have one finger pointing at somebody else, you have three fingers pointing back at you. You see how that goes? See how they point back at you? But what I'm saying is you got to be real with yourself to allow God to help you. And if you always are making justification of your sin, then I question where's your heart? Where's your motive? Something that my wife just talked about. I have a friend who says this. He says, if sin is your master, then the justification of sin becomes your obsession. Oh, 
If sin is your master, then the justification of sin becomes your obsession. Are you trying to overcome sin or are you trying to explain sin? Because if we're talking about igniting the fire, then we got to keep that sucker burning. And if the Holy Spirit is there as the oxygen to help keep us burning, then we don't want to stop the Holy Spirit. But we want to keep that going, keep that going, keep that going. We don't want to pour water on that fire. We want to keep that thing going. And sin, shame, and guilt works quicker than any other thing to try to put out that fire, to try to suffocate that fire, to try to get you to believe that, uh, well, maybe, maybe I don't have the fire anyway. But I have news for you. God is going to use you to do some amazing things. And I want to get to my last point, and then I'm ending. Shift the focus. Shift the focus. Number five, shift the focus. Um, you know, great teams, they make a habit of doing something very specific. They ha- make a habit of focusing on winning. Do you ever know a great team who goes in the locker room before the game and says, okay, guys, let's just try our best not to lose. <laughs> Come on, guys. No, we got to try real hard. Let's just not lose. One, two, three. Don't lose. <laughs> Woo! We're not losing. Don't lose. That's silly, right? Nobody does that. What winning culture says, let's not lose. All they say is, no, let's focus on getting the win. Let's focus on the W, right? Let's get this win. We're winners. We're champions. That's how we're going to do. I bet you the Golden State Warriors didn't focus on not losing, right? How many Steph Curry fans I got in here? Woo, Steph. Oh, Steph. Oh. All right, all right. And so they don't focus on not losing. They focus on winning because you will get more of what you focus on. So I have news for you. You will never overcome sin focusing on sin. You can't overcome sin focusing on sin. You overcome sin focusing on righteousness. You can't pass a math test studying for an English test, right? So you can't be the new man studying the old man habits. You have to study the new man. How does the new man behave? How does God's nature in me, how does that make me behave? What should I say? What should I do? As you focus on those things, you will find yourself becoming those things. You can't defeat sin focusing on sin. You can't be pure focusing on, oh, I just got to stop lusting. I just got to stop lusting. I just got to stop lusting. Or I just got to stop lying. I got to stop lying. I got to stop lying. Focus on purity. I just want to be pure before God. I just want to be pure before God. I want to live pure before him. I want to live right before him. I want to live pure holiness, conduct, and I want to start focusing on truthfulness. I want to live a life of integrity. I want to be honest. I'm honest. I'm a man who's honest, who lives a life of integrity. I always tell the truth. Even if it sometimes pains me a little bit, I always tell the truth. I always tell the truth. You will find yourself becoming what you focus on. When you shift the focus, you shift to winning. But if you don't shift the focus, it's hard for your brain to give you more of the thing that you haven't focused on. Read one more scripture and then we'll, I'll tell the story and I'll end. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 and 35. It says this. Um, can we go to verse... No, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 and 35. It says this, brood of vipers, snakes. (laughs) How can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Next verse. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. So it says that. Where your treasure is, whatever is treasured in your heart, like the treasure, we'll call it the deposit box of your heart, that is what you're going to bring out. That is what you're going to speak forth. You know, sometimes, sometimes I have youth and they'll slip and say something. They might throw a cuss word out there like, oh, oh I'm sorry, my bad, that was, that was an accident. I was like, no, it wasn't. 
It was in your heart, you just didn't catch it in time. Because it's impossible to bring something out of your heart into the atmosphere of your life if it is not deposited inside first. Am I preaching right, Pastor David? And so what I have found is that a lot of Christians, they have these heart issues where they expect results A, but they put in their heart all of B. And I can't expect A if I have put in B. Who puts in a thousand pennies in their bank account and expects to pull out a million dollars? Fool, no. Why? Because that's not what you put in there. So legally, you cannot require that and pull that back out. So I'll give you an example in the story. So one Wednesday night, um, it was after youth service, we had um, this young lady. She came forward. And this was years ago, maybe six years ago or so. But she came forward, and she came after service. She was crying. And she was, I mean, obviously she was distraught. And I was like, okay, what's, what's up? We can help you. And she was like, I just need prayer, Pastor David. I need prayer. <laughs> help me. And I was like, okay, what's going on? She said, I, I, I don't want to kill my brother. I was like, we don't want you to do that either. <laughs> Good, we don't want that either. Let's start from the beginning. And I said, well, are you mad at your brother? Or, you know, do y'all have issues right now? She's like, no, I love my little brother. Like, we're close, and, and I would never want to hurt him. I was like, okay. And I said, well, why, why do you feel like you want to kill me? She said, well, well, I, well, I don't. I said, okay. She said, but I keep feeling like something keeps telling me to. I keep feeling like something keeps pulling me to, like, like something is forcing me to, and, and I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I was like, wow, this is, this is deep. I sat back and just kind of inquired of the Holy Spirit for a moment, and then we had one of the other elders of the church. She came up, and she joined the conversation, and we started to ask some questions. You know, I talked about the asking questions. We started to ask some questions, and we found out that she loved scary movies, loved them. That's all she liked to watch, and as a matter of fact, she actually would go to sleep at night in the bed with them on her TV every night. She said she would fall asleep to them. I was like, oh, Lord. And I said, we're going to pray. We're going to bind the spirit of fear, of murder, of death. But I said, there's something that you have to do after we finish praying. You have to stop doing that. Because what's in your heart is now starting to speak to you. And when what's in your heart doesn't line up with what's in your head, it breeds confusion inside of you. Whenever you experience confusion, it's because your head and your heart are on separate sides. Your spirit might know what to do, but maybe your head is saying something. Or maybe your heart is saying something, but your logic is saying something different. And so I said, you know what you got to do? You, you got to turn that off. You got to stop. And after some conversation, she committed that she would change her behavior, and she did. Saw that young lady some time later, maybe some, some weeks, maybe a few months later, and she looked happy. And she was like, man, things are so much better, and, and those, those voices have stopped, and, and, and me and my brother are going, getting along great, and, and everything seems to be going so much better. I'm like, man, that's so great. And in that moment, it taught me a specific lesson, that we as humans, the way God has designed us with all of our intricacies, we as humans are designed to reproduce what we meditate. You are designed to reproduce what you meditate with your most de dominant thoughts on a daily basis. That's why it says in the scripture that you have to guard your heart with all diligence. That's why it says in the scripture that you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why it talks about that you can make your way prosperous and have good success as you meditate on the word of God day and night. Because what you put in your heart in abundance, it will come out. And that's why when you put the word of God in your heart in abundance, nobody can stop you. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what color your skin is, what background you have, what degree you do and don't have. Nobody can stop you from reaching your destiny but you. 
when the word of God is planted in your heart, it is so strong that it will succeed you out of any environment that you are in. Young people, hear me. The word of God has to be first place in our hearts. That is the thing that is the success portion of what God has given us. This is our manual, and this shows us what to do. It says in 1 Peter 5, 9, resist the devil steadfast in the faith. You got to tell the devil, not today, devil. You got to resist him. But what do you do? Resist him with the word of God. Take the sword of the spirit. Don't just let it lie on your shelf and collect dust. Don't just download the Bible app, but never read it, never open it. The word of God cannot benefit you if you never use it. It's like a weapon sitting there can't protect you if you never grab it. It's like a soldier can't do what they're called to do if they don't have the equipment or use the equipment, right? So God shows us his word is powerful, sharper than to any, two edge, any two-edged sword, and that is how we defeat sin and temptation. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for giving us this opportunity that we could learn of you we can inquire of you, Holy Spirit, that you can show us who you are and who we are in you. We thank you for your word, Lord, that it is first place in our lives. We will not be the biblically illiterate generation, Father, but we will know the word. We will live the word. We will speak the word. We will do the word. And we will get the word of God results that you have promised us. Now, Lord, I thank you that as this is ignite, that you are lighting something inside of us that can never be stopped, that can never be pushed down, that can never be buried, Father, but you are using us, Father, to change this generation, to change Chicagoland, to change even our local schools, Father, and our neighborhoods. Lord, give us a passion and a fire to love what you love, to detest what you detest, to say what you say, to speak life, Father. We thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give God a hand clap. Hallelujah.